So welcome to this presentation, why most content marketing is bullshit and how you can be successful using content as strategy. My name is Stephen Bynes and this presentation is part of the presentation that I gave at Campfire in Wong Chuk Hang um, on September the 28th, 2017. Unfortunately, on that day, we had a partial microphone fail, so uh, you couldn't really hear what I was saying to the audience properly. So I thought what I'd do instead is come back into the studio and, uh, and then give the presentation uh, in the studio environment, uh, get the information to you that way, and then uh, we'll then morph into the question and answer session from uh, the actual presentation itself, um, where the audio for uh, good grace purposes, thankfully, was fine. So um, uh, I'd like to get started and uh, take you on a journey that I think uh, you're probably going to find uh, interesting, uh, if not challenging. And if you are a content marketeer, uh, this may shake you to your core. So to kick off, what I really need to sort of ask you at this point is, um, what does content marketing actually mean? We use the word, the term content marketing freely. It's um, slipped into common parlance in the marketing profession. Uh, and uh, the words tend to sort of slip off your, uh, uh, off your, uh, off your tongue. Content marketing. So um, being a lawyer, what I decided to do was to sort of drill down on this idea of what content marketing might actually mean uh, and how it's kind of uh, defined, uh, certainly by... Uh, those who are, are thought leaders in the so-called content marketing space and, uh, and, and actually uh, what the general definition of what content marketing might actually mean. So in determining thought leadership over the entire content marketing space, you really have to look no further than the Content Marketing Institute and uh, the venerable Mr. Joe Peluzzi who um, was, uh, by his own admission and uh, by a certainly uh, common sort of appreciation, uh, is the godfather of content marketing, having coined the phrase um, content marketing uh, sometime previously um, and then gone on to define it uh, in this uh, following fashion with the Content Marketing Institute. Um, and he defined content marketing as the approach of creating and distributing valuable and consistent content to a targeted audience with the objective of driving some profitable action. Um, he then also subsequently anticipated that uh, the evolution of content marketing would include intelligent content, uh, as uh, the Content Marketing Institute has defined that as well. Uh, so, so anyway, clearly, if we're seeking to sort of understand what content marketing is, we look to our thought leaders in this regard. So being a lawyer, what I would naturally tend to do is to look at the meaning of the words that go to make up the phrase content marketing. So um, what I've done is I've gone to Wikipedia and I've looked at the definition of content as parlayed uh, uh, in what is arguably, you know, the, the, the most important collaborative dictionary uh, that there is in the world. So um, what does Wikipedia have to say about the term content? Well, they've defined it as, as follows. In publishing art and communication, content is the information and experiences that are directed towards an end user or audience. OK, so when I look at that, I think, what else could possibly be contained in that definition so far? It looks like all sort of manner of um, Material, so to speak, uh, are included in that definition. You might want to say education, perhaps, for example, in publishing art, uh, communication and education. Content is the information and experiences that are directed towards an end user audience. But I think we're probably splitting hairs there. I think for all practical purposes with, uh, with that definition, we're sort of anticipating uh, kind of everything that... Uh, uh, would amount to um, material that, uh, that, that, that is this content. Okay, so then we understand next that content is something that's to be expressed through a medium, such as speech, writing, or any of the various arts. Okay, so how else would, my, would you might um, express content? You're going to do it orally, you're going to do it in some sort of written communication, and you're going to do it in some, some kind of the various arts. Um, 
So I think that's pretty compelling as regards it kind of including everything, really. I can't think of any other way that you might be able to express um, so-called content. Anyway, um, let's look at the, uh, the, 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 the following part of the definition. Content can be delivered via many different media, including the internet, television, radio, audio CDs, books, magazines, and live events such as conferences and stage performances. So if that's the Wikipedia definition of uh, content, it's clear as mud, is it not? The definition of content equals everything. If something equals everything, then content marketing means everything marketing. Anyway, something, everything is an oxymoron. It makes no sense. Therefore, content marketing doesn't even exist as a discipline. It's mostly bullshit because nobody actually understands what people are talking about. So just have another look at that again, right? In publishing art and communications, content is the information and experiences that are directed towards an end user or audience. Content is something to be expressed through some medium, such as speech, writing, or any of the various arts. Content can be delivered by many different media, including the internet, television, radio, audio, CDs, books, magazines, and live events, such as conferences and stage performances. To my way of thinking, that means everything. So if it means everything, it actually means nothing. Therefore, let's turn our attention to the word marketing. So I don't think we really need to look too much further than the definition given by uh, Philip Kotler, who is uh, widely acknowledged as the world leading marketing expert. So let's look at uh, how he defines uh, in his seminal work, Kotler and Marketing, um, uh, the, the definition of marketing. So, marketing is the science and art of exploring, creating, and delivering value to satisfy the needs of a target market at a profit. Marketing identifies unfulfilled needs and desires. It defines, measures, and quantifies the size of the identified market and the profit potential. It, it pinpoints which segments the company is capable of serving best, and it designs and promotes the appropriate products and services. So when I look at the definition of marketing, I think we're on pretty safe ground there. So we don't need to um, qualify the definition of marketing by putting the word content in front of it. Because if you see, if you add the word content to the front of the uh, definition of marketing that's put forward by Philip Kotler, it's nonsensical, adds no value. So what's the upshot of all of this? Well, content marketeers who have rushed to embrace a new way of marketing, so to speak, in the modern society uh, where technology has changed everything uh, and has uh, upset the established marketing order, um, they've embraced this notion of content marketing that's been put out there by thought leadership. Uh, and in reality, when you understand um, the, the lack of a definition for content marketing, um, actually content marketers don't really know what they're doing because the definition isn't even defined. And I'd argue that there's no such thing as content marketing. My argument is that there's only marketing. Or perhaps there is something else again. So the real problem here is that nobody really appreciates what's really going on around us right now. What's happening is that we're moving from an industrial economy to a connection economy. And when you move from an industrial economy to a connection economy, everything changes. And my proposition is that if we are moving from an industrial economy to a connection economy, you can't take an industrial economy business, apply a so-called content marketing strategy onto the top of it, and expect to get connection economy type outcomes. What you have to do in the connection economy is very, very different from the things that you were doing in the industrial economy. In the connection economy, um, the only thing that uh, has any real meaningful value 
where we are in an age of over-communication that's just simply getting more and more onerous against us, the only thing that has any value is people's attention. And so if you're going to command people's attention and you understand it in the connection economy, you have to disaggregate and re-aggregate value because the ability to communicate and connect and form relationships in the connection economy creates new opportunities for the exchange of value. And if you seek to simply come along and put a content proposition over the top of the old way of providing value, when the market itself is geared up to receive a different kind of value, you're going to end up with the kind of problems that content marketeers have got, which is they've no idea what it is that they're communicating. They've no idea why they should be communicating what it is that they're doing. And they are struggling to make any kind of meaningful sense out of this concept of content marketing, which explains, in my view, why you haven't seen this thing take off in any meaningful way, given that you know, everybody's got a vested interest, all industrial economy businesses have got a vested interest in continuing to grow. So, so the resources that have gone into so-called content marketing down the years simply haven't reflected the return on the investment. And they haven't got the return on investment because I'll restate it. You can't take an industrial economy business, apply a content strategy on top of it, and expect to get connection economy type outcomes. And that is the real problem. Now, you know, it's not my place to um, in any way denigrate the, uh, the good work that has been done by, you know, excellent thought leaders such as um, Joe Paluzzi and Robert Rose. I've met both of these gentlemen previously, and as I said, I've only got the utmost respect for them. However, you know, they are responsible for promoting a certain way of thinking about content marketing, and I believe that, you know, they, they should be ready to... Um, to stand up, you know, for their, um, you know, for their beliefs and their uh, and, and their positions in terms of the, the the phrases that they've coined and the ideas that they've parlayed, um, with again with the greatest of respect, um, I'm going to uh, accuse these two gentlemen of potentially not engaging in real joined up thinking. Now, um, why do I say this? Well, he, he, here's a really good example of uh, of, of what I think is uh, is not engaging in joined up thinking. So at the Content Marketing World event 2017, which was held in September, just a few short weeks ago, um, Robert Rose communicated the following. Addressable audiences are the new product. Okay, so I look at this and I'm an intending content marketeer and I'm running a small business and I'm asking myself, well, I understand that this content marketing thing is, is pretty cool and pretty good and you know everyone's talking about it and I guess I should sort of get in on the act, right? So what are the guys that count in this space actually saying about this stuff? So I then see this tweet from Robert Rose, addressable audiences are the new products, and then I think to myself, well, how does that relate to me in any meaningful sense? What, 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 how does that help me solve my problem or help me sort of, you know, drive some sort of profitable action um, when I want to embrace this thing called content marketing? Um, well, apart from the fact that on the face of it, I just don't think that it actually makes any sense. Um, but then you again look at the definition of it, addressable audiences. Well, actually, everybody's addressable today via online, uh, online via Facebook or, Go or Google. So I don't think you've got a particular audience as such. And audiences is really, you know, to be found in the Super Bowl. Super Bowl is the only true audience you know, rock concerts, places where large numbers of people physically gather together uh, to receive some kind of communication or some sort of, you know, medium. Or audiences per se, in my view, certainly, you know, implied in Robert Rose's work here, suggests to me that this is an, an industrial economy audience. Um, because today, when you are um, on the receiving end of some sort of communication, having been addressed via Facebook or Google, Principally, you are not having that exchange of, of communication with the party, communicating with you, thinking that you're part of a bigger audience. You're actually thinking, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in the process of having a relationship with this particular person, so we're going to exchange some sort of value. So that sort of the psychology of the moment doesn't impart itself to be that of what normally manifests itself in, a, in, in someone who's in an audience, Super Bowl, Super Bowl style. 
No, what it is, it's, it's all about individuals wanting to sort of communicate and engage their attention with the party that's communicated to them. So, so I don't think there's any addressable audiences per se. I think what you have is a potential tribe made up of individual people. And so your, your, your marketing communications need to be directed towards the particular needs of the individual uh, and not to some, some generally defined, audi ill-defined audience who, who as, as I say, simply aren't readily, um, readily gathering or congregating these days. Um, so, 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 you know, that's my problem with, with the word addressable audiences. And then you go on to ask, you know, um, uh, ask what do they mean by the new product? Um, so an addressable audience is the new product. Um, I just don't understand what that means. Uh, and I know that uh, anyone else who is really starting out wanting to sort of be led by the whole uh, aspect of so-called content marketing would struggle with something like that. So I would suggest that today some of our so-called uh, thought leaders haven't engaged in any meaningful joined-up thinking. And again, I think this um, concern that I have about uh, the, the sort of the direction that uh, content marketing thought leadership is taking people in is reflected in the, um, in the eight big questions that uh, um, are left over from the Content Marketing World 2017 conference, um, essentially saying that these should be on the tip of your tongues really all year round. So what are these big questions that they're talking about? So what if we think about our content marketing like George Lu Lucas did about Star Wars. Well, I just struggle with that because, you know, here I am. You might say I'm a content marketeer, although actually I'm an intelligent content marketeer. Um, you know, how I'm, what am I supposed to learn from, you know, the statement that we should start thinking, you know, like George Lucas did about Star Wars? I, I just simply don't understand that. Secondly, what if we look for unexpected audiences? Well, I mean, apart from the fact that you don't have any audiences, what you have is a bunch of individuals that, you know, you're potentially going to have a relationship with. Um, you know, what's an unexpected audience? I, again, I just struggle to sort of, you know, um, com com complete my, my understanding of their vernacular here. Uh, moving on, what if our audience tells our brand story? Why, why would they? Why would anybody engage in promoting you know, what you think you're all about. Don't they have enough things to do? Isn't it your job to communicate your brand story, not your so-called audience? Okay, I think this is a real telltale too. What if we pay more attention to our customers than our industry? Well, bingo. One of the burning questions that I've always had about this thing called content marketing, and in fact, any, any of these sort of advertising uh, industry uh, awards uh, and uh, anyone else is sort of patting themselves on the back because of their uh, creative genius in, in communicating. Um, all these sort of awards type things, I've, I've never really given them any truck because I have to ask myself the question, you know, if, if I win one of these awards, how does that help me provide a better experience to my customer? I just simply don't understand that it's going to add any value. All it's going to do is going to say to my customers, look, uh, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm not really concentrating all my efforts on what's important to you. I'm really, you know, faffing around at the back end trying to get peer recognition for how brilliant I am. So, you know, if, if this is a burning question to be asked all year round, what if we pay more attention to our customers than our industry? I think the Content Marketing Institute is saying everything about themselves because it's, it's not about, you know, the individual, sorry, about the, the, the content marketeers, so to speak, and the industry and the profession, all the noise that they make and the opinions they've got and, and uh, all the patting on the back that goes on to say how good they are at what they do. Ultimately, marketing is about the customer. It's not about anything else. And you should be direct to all your efforts and energy in delivering value to your customer and helping them how, and, uh, by helping them answer their questions and solve their problems. Um, so anyway, I think that, uh, you know, Content Marketing Institute have, uh, have really sort of led us down the garden path in this regard. Because not only do we, uh, do we not have a common definition of what it is that we're talking about when we, when we, when we utter the words content marketing, but we all just seem to be so full of ourselves as to, you know, why... Um, why they're so good at what they do. 
And, uh, you know, when you read the rest of these questions, I think you're left with uh, a conclusion that uh, there doesn't seem to be any real joined up thinking here. And there doesn't seem to be sort of any appreciation of how um, content marketing per se, uh, you know, doesn't actually vie with how the real world works. We live in a connection economy, not an industrial economy. And with a connection economy, you start things differently and you use content to communicate your final messaging in having designed a, a, a strategy for the connection economy. And that, uh, and that strategy is, uh, is something I'm going to be uh, alluding to a little bit later as we move through the rest of the presentation. OK, so um, it's not just me, I think, that has come to this kind of conclusion. Um, I'll take you next to a, uh, a piece of work that was actually recorded uh, by the Content Marketing Institute themselves back in 2012. Um, saying that Coca-Cola was betting the farm on content marketing. Um, so uh, what was that all about? Well, in 2012, Coca-Cola, um, you know, the world's uh, most important, biggest marketing company, uh, made an announcement and produced a very interesting piece of uh, content on YouTube, um, basically uh, announcing that they were moving from creative excellence to content excellence. And, um, and that they, they were going to go whole hog on this idea of, in, of content marketing. And, and their uh, notion of content excellence was um, defined in a, a liquid and a linked strategy. Now, what does a liquid and a linked strategy mean? Well, liquid uh, basically meant that uh, they were going to unleash memes, they were going to unleash ideas into, uh, into society. Uh, and that those memes and those ideas were going to be intrinsically linked to the goals of Coca-Cola. Uh, and um, by doing that, taking the ideas out of the hands of Coca-Cola and going into society uh, where they basically become uncontained uh, and then the community takes over those ideas. And as a result of having been able to take over those ideas, the commercial interests of Coca-Cola are reflected uh, in, in the normal way through you know, brand exposure and obviously the, uh, the ultimate uh, uh, intention to sell, sell product. But, but this was the idea of, of Coca-Cola, uh, announced with great fanfare and uh, not in considerable investment to uh, progress a, licked, uh, excuse me, a liquid and a linked strategy uh, for content excellence. So then you, uh, you look at the Coca-Cola homepage, which was the, uh, the main prism of, uh, of the application of this strategy uh, in 2013. And you can see that they've gone all very sort of, you know, the Coca-Cola journey style. They're talking about food. They're talking about lifestyle. They're talking about music. It's uh, this sort of, you know, softly, softly approach uh, to, to projecting a, a corporate image via their corporate website. So the strategy was then implemented, and then uh, a very, uh, very well-respected commentator um, looked at the um, website, the homepage of Coca-Cola, just to see how this liquid and link strategy was was taking shape and how it was going to be reflected on the, um, you know, on, on, on the main website of Coca-Cola. Uh, and then he wrote in this article: Should Coca-Cola quit its journey, its content marketing journey? Well. Essentially, he says that he discovered that the level of interactions on the website was negligible. The average number of shares from a post to Facebook was less than 1,000 to LinkedIn, uh, not many at all, and to, uh, to Twitter, again, small numbers, all things considered. And each post averaged just eight comments only, and two-thirds of the posts received no comments at all. So, you know, it was clear that whatever they were putting out on their website was, was not actually leading to, you know, the outcomes that the, um, the liquid and link strategy was supposed to be delivering. So indeed now, if you look at the Coca-Cola homepage and, uh, and look to see how the uh, liquid and link strategy has, um, has delivered uh, sort of a, a manifest change to the way that Coca-Cola are projecting themselves via their corporate website, I think you'll see it's really gone back to every old corporate website. There's really no difference whatsoever. And the idea being behind the liquid and link strategy was to uh, receive a disproportionate share of, uh, of popular culture. And I think that's right. Um, I think that the whole uh, content marketing linked and li liquid strategy was, um, you know, em emanating from the idea that this content marketing concept 
was going to be the sort of the salvation and the true future of how um, businesses were going to commun- communicate with their customers and their prospect uh, clients. Um, so uh, if you look at the YouTube video, they're, they're announcing their move from creative excellence to content excellence. The cartoon says, ah, look, holidays are coming. That means Coca-Cola. Now, you know, this is a cartoon and one must look at it tongue in cheek. But I think there is a truism to be found in this cartoon because, um, you know, if you're trying to move somebody's psychology into associating holiday with a soft drink, then, uh, and they're going to use so-called content marketing techniques for that, uh, that's a pretty tall order to go about being able to achieve that. And one must assume that after having invested into this and tried it out in the marketplace without without really following up on how the experience was had by Coca-Cola, they haven't, fa- they haven't been successful in the mission. And I, I think that uh, uh, this cartoon and that reality represents the fact that uh, it's just a bridge too far. You can't achieve those kind of outcomes with, with content. People just don't invest their attention in a sustained and a long enough fashion for you to be able to be successful like that. Uh, and and certainly, you know, if this is if Coca Cola was struggling with this, how does it mean for your SME with, you know, one individual or, or four or five people working in that business and they want to, you know, really get ahead in marketing and they invest into this idea of content marketing, so to speak, then um, you know, if Coca Cola can't be successful with it, what hope is there for them? Okay, so that's me being essentially dissing so-called content marketing for, uh, well, you know, last, uh, last few minutes at least. Um, so, you know, where do I fit in all of this? What's, uh, what, what's our contribution to this story? Well, um, I'd like you to watch this video, please. It's only 15 minutes and it's in 10 short parts. Barnes, co-founder of the Hong Kong Visa Center. Five years ago, after trying to upkeep a forever failing business, I almost became bankrupt. So, out of necessity, in 2011, I set out to change the way I do business. I really needed to. I was going under. The journey I travelled in the last five years has been a revelation. You see, Against all the odds and starting with nothing, by 2017, we've created the conditions for a monopoly in our space, Hong Kong Immigration. Make no mistake, we have significant and very well-resourced competitors, but by being nimble-footed, standing out and doing things differently, a monopoly awaits us in our service niche. And by focusing on a single competency, and learning how the internet really works, we began to lay the foundations of the Hong Kong Visa Center business and inadvertently created the genesis of a monopoly in our niche. And you can too in yours. In my next video, I will urge you to do the thinking to make it happen. The first step in building any monopoly is to seriously do the thinking. I found myself inspiration and guidance in the writings of various people in building my monopoly. I took inspiration from the words and wisdom of my intellectual heroes, Don Tapscott, Seth Godin, Kevin Kelly and Charlie Munger, some of which I'll share with you later. My business partner and I analysed the competition in the Hong Kong immigration marketplace. There were two major competitors in the market. One was a company I'd been a founding partner in, while the other was the world's largest immigration practice for whom I had previously worked. So, I knew their strengths and their weaknesses. I also knew the market was split between two service sectors, 15% in the individual services sector and 85% in the corporate services sector. 
and from my experience I knew that the first 15% consisted of people having problems that no one else was properly addressing. So we decided to re-enter the market in the individual services sector first where we would be competing against non-consumption. Our aim would be to produce high quality content giving people answers to their questions and help solving their problems. All for free. Sounds crazy, right? Well, soon you'll find out that it's not just as crazy as it sounds. In business, we'll always have competition, and choosing to be different is the only way to stand out above the rest of the market. When we began setting up the Hong Kong Visa Centre, we had two basic principles in mind. These were two principles put forward by the great Charlie Munger. The first of Munger's principle was that to be successful, you have to do one thing and if you can do it better than everybody else, success is guaranteed. The second was to apply the golden rule to all of your relationships. This is to treat other people in the same way you would wish to be treated yourself. These were our foundation stones when setting up the Hong Kong Visa Centre. Next, we drew on the marketing genius of Seth Godin who says, to get people's attention these days, you must be remarkable, be outstanding. So, we decided it would certainly be extraordinary to give away all of our intellectual property for free to anyone who wanted it. That's 20 odd years of accumulated Hong Kong immigration knowledge and know-how. So we used our experience and knowledge to imagine every possible question, problem, scenario and idea that could arise within our niche of Hong Kong immigration. And we wrote it down, creating the Hong Kong Visa Handbook. No one else was doing that. But my philosophy is, if information is going to be free, it may as well own free. Once we decided to give our information away for free, we then had to decide how best to go about doing it. We needed to build a platform in order for anyone to access our information easily at any time on demand. We reached out for the free open source content management system called WordPress. Now you have to realize that at some point the mighty Google is going to be sifting its way through your material looking for the best stuff to guide people to. So you have to make sure your taxonomy is right. It's vital that you get this nailed so that the search engines know exactly what you offer. WordPress enables you to do this. We've learned that in today's connection economy, you have to be generous. Consequently, our websites invite people to engage with our materials, to reach out and ask questions, which we answer via our blogs. We've come to understand the common experiences and tasks involved in our niche, so we publish online do-it-yourself kits for free. By giving away all our experience and know-how for free, we create close relationships and generate goodwill. The next step in building a monopoly can be expressed in just a few words. Nevertheless, it's vitally important. You must be totally transparent. My story is on our website for everyone to know. As an immigration advisor, people are opening up all their personal details to me and pretty much putting their future lives in my hands. So I believe I have an obligation to reciprocate the trust that they place in me. To create and maintain effective relationships, you have to be transparent. You must tell people your own personal story. Show them that you're authentic and trustworthy. And above all, let them see that you're vulnerable, just like they are, just like we all are. 
I learned very quickly from the beginning that most of what you hear about search engine optimization doesn't apply to many businesses. It's mainly a bunch of propeller heads attempting to outfox Google. This is okay for a few niches, but it's futile for mine and especially for professional services. So, when building our business model, we use WordPress to mount the platform for our core content site, the Hong Kong Visa Handbook, and our daily content update site, Hong Kong Visa Giza, and the Hong Kong Visa Center. We sell nothing on the first two sites. Instead, we publish content in straightforward language, providing answers and solutions to problems, which leads to the third where we have conversations, form relationships, and offer our professional service. It's a simple strategy. Make your material widely and freely available to those interested in your niche by anticipating all their questions that could be asked about it, answer them, and cultivate relationships. In the end, all roads lead to Rome. In order to sell something, you need to know what you're selling. Obvious? Well, it's essential if you to leverage your platform and disrupt your marketplace, and you need to find a way to sell stuff that your competitors can't. We knew from experience that the traditional way of selling immigration services is through fear. You say to clients, I've got this knowledge and know-how, and if you don't pay me, you probably won't get your visa. And then what are you going to do? Now, you don't have to read Robert Caldini's Secrets of the Science of Persuasion to know that fear is a terrible basis for any relationship. But if you do read him, you'll learn how to harness the psychological hardwiring that we've all evolved. You see, we realized that what we were selling was peace of mind. By giving away all of our knowledge and know-how to people who need it, by being open and transparent, we've engendered our authority and we've established their trust. Also, because of the relationship we build with people, we know enough about them to only take on those applications that we genuinely think will succeed. So, in that regard, we can offer a 200% money back guarantee and people employ our services because they're buying peace of mind. Not a visa label and a passport. A few years ago, I found myself aboard a ship on a four-day Disney cruise in the Caribbean with my family. I was astonished by the customer service experience that Disney provided. It was no Mickey Mouse affair, it was absolutely second to none. And it made me realise that if you're in control of a particular environment, as the Disney Corporation were on that ship, then you can lay out a complete experience for people. If you understand what sort of experience is going to resonate with your audience and then you deliver a customer service experience encompassing it, you basically have achieved total market alignment. By understanding our potential clients, by understanding all the potential scenarios they'll face during the immigration process and by answering all their questions, solving all their problems for free, we're providing an unrivaled customer service experience, an absolutely essential step towards building a monopoly. While it's vitally important to propagate your online proposition, it's just as vital to take your offline proposition as far as you can into the wider world. Seth Godin calls this unleashing the idea virus. My idea virus was born about 15 years ago. Once a month I'd go on RTHK, the public radio broadcaster in Hong Kong, to take calls, answer questions and generally talk about immigration issues. The host, Phil Whelan, took to announcing me as Stephen Barnes, the Hong Kong visa geezer. I thought, that's good, that's catchy, that's something people will really remember. Which is important because immigration isn't a live idea in most people's minds every day. But when the issue does crop up, it's crucial. And if the first thing that pops into their heads is the visa geezer, that'll be the first thing they search for online. From that, you can build what Seth Godin calls a tribe. 
combine the two and you have a tridea virus with which to build your monopoly. Our tribe is currently 150,000 strong and growing. By now, I'm sure you're asking, so have you built your monopoly yet? Well, it's no secret, not yet, although we're very nearly there. We already enjoy a monopoly on content in the immigration niche and have a 50% market share on one type of visa. But as Peter Thiel says in his book Zero to One, you need to have a secret. We continuously follow a checklist derived from Thiel's book as follows. 1. Do we have an engineering advantage? Yes. In my losing years, I learned how to convert Microsoft Outlook into a sort of electronic file effect. This gave me insights into how others organize their backends, and so, how to organize ours. 2. Was the time right? Yes, because I was broke, but also because our competitors were still doing the same old thing, so the opportunity to disrupt the market was ripe. 3. Were we starting with a small share of a big market? Yes, and we were competing against non-consumption. 4. Do we have the right team? Yes, my business partner of nearly 20 years and I can read each other's minds by now. We recruit the right people and we treat them with respect. We follow the golden rule, so they like working for us. 5. Is your distribution organised? Yes, we nailed that from the get-go through our business model by design. 6. Will our position be defensible in 10 to 20 years from now? Yes, absolutely, because we publish 4 or 5 times a week and the more we publish, the more difficult it is for our competitors to steal our thunder. We've made 3 million US dollars in the first 5 years and built a tribe of 150,000 strong. All because of this, we found our secrets lots of them. If you follow this approach in your niche using your experience, you'll develop secrets that give you an angle that your competitors don't have. There are lots of secrets out there. You need to do the thinking and find them. So as it's clear from this presentation that I don't have much truck with the term content marketing, um, what I would propose to you is a new way of thinking about marketing. So in the Hong Kong Visa Center, what we've done is we've applied enabling technology, developed a high quality content platform, introduced disruptive service design, developed value-laden pricing, injected all throughout the science of persuasion, included an irresistible offer, designed to generate a tribe who propagate an idea virus where all the risk is completely reversed and you produce in your high quality content platform sufficient content to go on to map the knowledge graph in that niche and therefore dominate search. So rather than dealing with this concept called content marketing, we've encapsulated all the lessons that we've learned and documented everything that we've learned in a very high quality content fashion um, that is available on this website called the Encyclopedia of Intelligent Content Marketing. And the question that this website exists to address is, do you want to build a monopoly from nothing with no money invested. This material reflects everything that we've learned uh, since 2010 and how we've manifested the business model that uh, reflects the Hong Kong Visa Center proposition and how we drew down on all the um, guidance and, uh, and inspiration from my four intellectual heroes, Charlie Munger, Seth Godin, um, Don Tapscott, and Kevin Kelly. Um, 
Tr Seth Godin says that ideas that spread win, uh, and he's absolutely right. Uh, we believe that uh, given that content marketing is a failing proposition uh, and that we are in a connection economy, not an industrial economy, that you can, as uh, a small business, as a professional service provider, really of any size, uh, if you have the wherewithal to make the adjustment, uh, you can um, build a monopoly in your own particular niche that's going to um, accord with how the realities of, uh, of modern life works in the connection economy. Uh, and as long as you publish over time, you're going to go on to build that monopoly if your material is designed to answer questions and help solve problems, creating the basis of relationships and then subsequently going on to exchange value um, as a result of uh, that uh, relationship creation dynamic. So you can find our membership site, which is 100% free on build a monopoly with dot intelligent content dot marketing. And it serves to answer the question, do you want to build a monopoly from nothing with no money invested? So now I'll take you back to the presentation uh, with uh, Simeon Katsov and I and taking questions from the audience and uh, uh, look forward to discussing with you uh, on Facebook. OK, guys, I'm sure. This presentation has sparked some questions. So if you want to ask Steven anything, if you're just starting out, laying out your content platform, if you have any questions how to get started, you can bring them on now. And if not, I have a question myself. Sure. Uh, obviously, you enjoy a huge pool of content right now. You've enjoyed a snowball effect. That, that's how you've built a monopoly within your niche. But what is the one thing you would focus if you would start from the very beginning? You're all by yourself. You don't have that huge team producing the content. Yeah. Um, there, in, in, within intelligent content marketing, there's two plays. You've got the sort of the long-term, let's build a content platform play, which builds over time. Um, and today, you've got basically the direct response marketing play. Now, when we started this six years ago, there was no no ability to engage in a direct response marketing play because the, the technology that we needed and the sort of the intellectual nous that went into structuring a technology that would deliver seamlessly on a, on a direct response marketing play wasn't available. So we had to incrementally grow over time. But now there is a technology called click funnels that for basically software as a surface costs, they've encapsulated the total capability response marketing capability. So you can produce a piece of content for your, for your content platform that's going to serve the basis of a monopoly over time. You can use that content strategically to basically go out and buy revenue. Um, and that's really easy to do now. So uh, you can work to build a monopoly by starting off with limited resources, investing in a direct, um, uh, uh, direct response marketing initiative in relation to content that's going to create the opportunity to have relationships with people and use the money that you earn there to, to invest into content and build your content platform out like in that fashion. And is there any structure you would follow if you would start with a content platform from the very beginning? What are the essential piece for such a strategy to be effective and successful? Um, well, you have to define your taxonomy, right? So you think about your niche and you say, right, what do I know about this niche? I'm going to write everything down that I know about this niche. And once I've written everything down that I know about this niche, I'm going to say to myself, well, what kind of problems do people have that you, know, you can use the knowledge that you have about this niche? And then how can you deliver your material in such a way so it's structured in a fashion so that when people come across it, they don't have to get intellectually engaged in it. They just have to sort of DIY guide it, right? And take okay. the piece out and follow the arrows type of stuff. Um, so that sort of taxonomy should be you know, your first mission. And then um, ask yourself what are the top 100 questions that anybody ever asked you about your niche. And then come up with answers to those questions and produce your content around that, around that basis. That's the thing to do first. OK. And uh, I know you like to stay away from tactical stuff. Yeah. Try to show the big picture. Um, but from your experience, is there any type of content that all the platforms favor, meaning Google, Facebook, any type of content that performs better than the rest, or that really depends on your niche? Um, it depends on the question that you're answering. 
because you know what performs well as content the ultimate metric is how many people are being exposed to it right okay yeah. so uh, you can produce a piece of content that answers a question in any number of ways right an infographic you can do it in a podcast or uh, a video write whatever you need to write it's not that sort of you know complicated to do and uh, the content that you design as long as it's sort of interesting sort of visually to look at and it doesn't overwhelm you with stuff um, doesn't really matter about that what's ultimately important as regards um, you know what it means is is what question does it answer and you know how relevant is the answer that you've put out there and uh, and is it structured in such a way so that they you know the widest number of people can get access to that that's where the real focus is on con producing content I feel okay uh, and also in the presentation earlier on, you touch upon that an industrial economy business such as Coca-Cola couldn't benefit from a content strategy. So what if you have an industrial type of business, meaning that you're producing you know, mass products and you want to add this content strategy on top of your business? Is that how it's going to work or how you can go about it? Well, well it, just, it just seems to me right, that if you've got something to sell, okay. right, you have to understand the psycho-emotional dynamics of the party that you're wishing to sell it to and then look past the idea of selling and say right you know what is their problem and what value can I deliver to at least get their engagement and their attention and then ensure that whatever it is that you sell accords with the, the best possible solution that they can receive in their hands is. so you, you kind of need to know in advance you know what it is that you sell right and then if you know what you sell then what results in terms of a value exchange, it's just, a, it's just a, a natural result of the, the dynamics of the connection economy working in the way that it does, and us as human beings interacting with, you know, material that's all around us in the connection economy. Okay. And you also said that you put all the content out there for free, yeah. meaning that the people can solve their problems. Yeah. Uh, but how you go about getting these customers into paying customers, meaning the ones that are browsing your website and they all have all their answers? Why would they ever need your services? Okay. So the thing to appreciate about that question is that there are two types of customers for an immigration service. In fact, I think there's two types of customers for anything. There's those that want to pay and those that don't want to pay. Okay. So it used to be that those that don't want to pay were a liability in the industrial economy. Today, those people that don't want to pay are actually a much bigger asset than those people who do want to pay. Because it's those people who don't want to pay that drive the generation of the tribe and the popularity of that sync on the internet with all of that stuff. And that, that's the equity in the business, right? Uh, the money that comes out of you know, all of that activity is really just those people who want to pay because they're ultimately buying what it is that we're selling and what we're selling is peace of mind. And they can't get peace of mind by consuming our content and doing it themselves. Certain people can't anyway, um, but those people who have decided now, I now know that uh, this involves a lot of work, I now understand what my problem is, a few issues associated with that, uh, I would much rather give this money to this gentleman, to this organisation, who are saying they can make this problem go away, oh and by the way, if they don't make the problem go away, they're going to not only return, return my money, they're going to give me double their money, their money. So by having that irresistible offer. Yeah, so it, it, it's the constituent elements of content marketing, intelligent content marketing, that creates the conditions where there doesn't have to be a conversation about whether I'm going to help you or not. Um, there is, you know, the practical conversation about, yes, would you take care of me? Yes, I will, and this is what it, what it costs and whatever. But there's no effort to try and move anybody's position. Okay. And another tactical question, when you're starting out, how often should you put content out there? I know you do that several times a week when you're starting out ideally. Well, the New York Times bought a, a content platform uh, about 18 months ago for 30 million US dollars, and they had a thousand, less than 1,000 pages on that website. Um, so I think you need to be producing content as fast as you possibly can. I mean, you don't have to go crazy on it. You know, for me, when I started out, I knew that I wanted to get 500 pieces of content down immediately. 
because without 500 pieces of content, I, I, I just didn't have the confidence that this was going to work. I didn't have that much time. I didn't have the luxury of time. I needed to generate revenue. So I needed to move fast. Um, but, you know, that's just me. I'm a little bit sort of eccentric. Right? I just want to get on with it. Um, I think you can produce a, a piece of content every day. You can publish a piece of content every day for a year consistently, and then you've got a pretty decent you know, pool of content that you can work with. But the interesting thing is that it doesn't actually need to take you a great deal of time to produce that content, right? So you've got the video chatter one hour free gig. So come in. In that one hour, you can produce, speak to camera, showcase your knowledge and expertise. You can produce at least 10 pieces of content in that time. Right, so then you take that, that, that footage and you can go home to your Windows or your Mac machine and you can post produce it really cheaply, easily, quickly, and what have you. And then all of a sudden, you've now got 10, 10 videos out of what was an hour in the studio and possibly a couple of hours of post production when you've gotten home. Um, you can then decide that you want to have a conversation with somebody that is also knowledgeable in your niche, and you know that can just be a recorded conversation for a potential podcast, just recorded on your iPhone. Sit there and talk for an hour, and as long as you're addressing an agenda that is delivering real value to those people that are interested in that material, whatever it may be, then there you know you've got perhaps another ten pieces of content there, and you just produce these every day and publish it over time. Google recognises you're a consistent publisher, and they start to you know give you credit for this subject matter that's clearly materialising because of the taxonomy which they've come to understand. Um, uh, and it's sort of, you know, one step at a time. When I, when, I, when I made the decision that I was going to rewrite the Hong Kong Visa Handbook, it was a case of, okay, um, I know this material, I need, to, I need to write the book. So I wrote the book, and then once I wrote the book, it was a case of how can I turn this really dry, boring material into something that's visually, you know, worth looking at and, that, you know, Within, my, within the edge of my own personal competencies. Um, and then after that, it, once that was down, it, it was just a case of taking every opportunity to um, get the tribe to ask me questions. And from that, I got content I couldn't even think of, I couldn't even dream of like, personal people, so personal circumstances. Um, and so that's a, a, ready, uh, a ready source of it. Uh, and you know, the community, values that because you make an effort to answer the questions and, uh, and adds to the content mix. So it's a sort of a self-fulfilling, fueled, self-fueled, if you will, sort of material creation uh, endeavor that just doesn't take a lot of effort and a lot of energy on at all. And the returns that you get are just endless. And how do you go about distributing that content? Do you do it on your own platform? You said you use WordPress, but... Well, yeah, so it's, all, it's on WordPress, and 75% uh, of our traffic is Google Organic. Okay. Uh, and then we, we have a normal, so we, we publish it in all our social media sites, uh, and then when there's an interesting piece of content that I think will uh, really give us an opportunity to widen the tribe in a, in a focused way, uh, then we'll boost the piece of content specifically for that uh, situation. Um, yeah, but you know, you publish over time, and you uh, become acknowledged by Google for you know what you offer. Uh, Google Google gives it to you. It's easy. Yep. <laughs> Hi. So the core of, of your intelligent content marketing is really answering all the questions that your target audience has, right? Um, so how do you prioritize which questions you should be answering first? Um, you should think about the problems that, that underlie the questions and then ask yourself, can you produce content that will allow those underlying problems to be addressed in a do-it-yourself manner? Um, and produce that, that content first because that's kind of, you know, you, you can identify what, what those challenges are in advance, right, if you know what the problem is. And that, that gives you what you need to have a sort of a base platform. And then, then you can ask yourself all well, the top 100 questions that ever asks about what you do. Uh, and you can produce content around that. Uh, and then simultaneously create a proposition where people will ask you questions and you then get an opportunity to sort of produce material that's in direct response to what the audience is asking for. Yeah, so it makes a lot of sense for 
um, like immigration or visas, right? Someone could essentially go through all those steps themselves. But what about something that someone's going to buy? Something like, is what? Someone's going to buy like, like a product. You have a product. Yeah. Coca Cola. Yeah, like they can't really make that themselves. Right? That's, your content strategy isn't going to be to define how to make the Coke themselves necessarily. No, it, no indeed, indeed. And uh, I'm not suggesting that this is a panacea to everything. What I'm suggesting is this is a new way to think about how you can develop your own proposition in your own niche using the dynamics of the connection to come in your favor. I mean, there were, there, there's, there's different strokes for different folks, right? Industrial economy, it's the same. And, uh, and, the, and if, you, if you kind of like really understand what's happening in the connection economy, take a step back and you say, well, what are Google doing? What have Google done? Uh, you know what they've done. They've mastered that whole area of search and they're understanding that they're going into all these other things that are sort of over the horizon for us and there's no reason for them not to be in it, right? I mean, they've got the resources, they've got the intellectual powerhouse, they know how the web works. So you expect them to go into that stuff. So they're, they're dominating new niches that have yet to be defined, right? Uh, then you've got Facebook and they've handled, they've managed that whole social, you know, platform thing. Um, Skype have essentially handled, you know, internet telephony. Uber have done what they've done and what they've done. And Airbnb is doing what they've done. Apple have, you know, taken on the mantle that are just about the hardware interface, right, between humans and, and the web. That's what that's all about. Um, so you can come along with ideas like this and apply them to you know, your knowledge of your niche uh, and inject these ideas in and they'll always be different because every niche is different um, and you can then go on in your own little way, master your little mini niche and keep everybody out because over time it's still just all going to accrue in your favour and for us the uh, the, the industrial economy way of providing an immigration service was basically based on fear um, and scarcity. But in the connection economy, it's not about fear, it's about relationships, it's about trust. Um, and it's not about uh, scarcity, it's about abundance. So by unlocking, in my instance, the knowledge that I have as to what people's real problem is, which is the paying for peace of mind, then I could just build, using all of these ideas and these techniques, a proposition incrementally. I didn't have a, a roadmap that said this is what it's going to look like, because I'm not that smart. Um, but incrementally I came to understand how it all worked, right, through trial and error. And, and there's, a, there's a couple of pieces extra to add to this, um, which we're, we're injecting ours we've learned. And I, I suspect that this isn't you know, the last word on, on, on how this thing will evolve. But uh, yeah, this is it's not a panacea, it's, it's available as a series of ideas for people to draw down and to determine you know, whether there's any value in it for them. If nothing else, it provides some kind of explanation for the malaise that exists around content marketing and you know, the fact that the industrial looks like this and the connection looks like this and the, the installed base, the legacy of the industrial economy, which is still 99.999% of all human economic activity, you know, they haven't got a clue what this is all about. They only view their lives through this prism. And you, you can't understand what this is all about unless you get involved in it and experience it. And so I talk about secrets. I know stuff about my marketplace that my competitors will never be able to know. Right? And that just gives me such a huge, compelling advantage. And I'll share, I'll share a little bit of something with you on this. That um, in, our, in the immigration space, what happens, or historically happened, was that small national practices like I have in Hong Kong never get access to the really big, uh, big clients because the really big clients are all ultimately the clients of the world's biggest global relocation service companies and they control the relationship with, with, the, with the client and they get to choose through their own RFP processes who goes on to be the sort of on the ground provider in locations where they may not have that capability themselves. And historically, these big global relocation service firms, what they do is they look to the, there's four or five major players that have got a global capability. And they'll just seek to transact with one of those for three or four years and then put the whole thing open for global RFP again. Uh, and that was like that for 25 years. Um, and I used to participate in those kinds of initiatives because of you know, my previous career in this space. Anyway, 
The problem with that is that it's basically a race to the bottom because it's commoditization all the time. And you can't take a professional service and, and apply commoditization sort of, you know, pressures to them without there being some sort of pushback. But essentially what's happened is it's been a race to the bottom and whilst the quality has kind of been maintained, the service, the, the technical quality has been maintained clearly because they're lawyers, but the service is shocking because they're just chop shops, right? Anyway, in recognition of that, this year apparently one of the major global relocation service firms have decided that they want to actually go past that model and they want to look inside the countries to see what's interesting there, to see if there's any kind of interesting proposition. So that's manna from heaven for me because I was invited to bid on a piece of work for, for, for corporate clients in Hong Kong that I would never be able to win independently because of the dynamic of you know, global relocation services. So I'll get to the point. The point is this, that I put my pricing schedule in and I have priced it competitively Price that where there's value that will clearly accrue to us, but I've also now included a total free of charge video content production capability to reconfigure how they communicate all of their um, uh, relationship dynamics with their customers. So I can come in and I can offer that completely free of charge with other resources and the capability to do it, which immediately means that whatever I'm competing with against my competition is not going to be about price. The conversation in this piece is going to be about this interesting opportunity that's come along to have a, a look at a way to do new and interesting things with immigration. And by the way, they themselves are already doing new and interesting things because it's all manifested on the internet, so there's something in this. So there's an opportunity for me to have conversations which I can finally get access to, potentially, you know, the, the big, big, big clients. Um, and that's all come about just because I'm able to sell stuff that my competitors can't. Yeah, what is your product for uh, intelligentcontentmarketing.com? There is no product. So it's just a free resource, essentially. Ideas that spread win. So it's like something you do in your spare time because it's something that you're interested in. It's not like... Um, like someone couldn't hire you to be their mentor to help them in the content marketing. Well, like one, 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 of the, one of the problems about being an immigration advisor is that you make your money by owning people's problems. Yeah. So I'm 55 soon. I thought I've, I've done enough now. Right? Yeah. 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 Um, Do you accept like user submitted content too? But eventually, yeah, absolutely. I'm, 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 absolutely, we're going to build a tribe around this idea. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because it's probably not cheap for you to produce all of this stuff yourself. Well, hear, hear, hear this, right? The best way to market a business is to tell the story of the business. And really, all I'm doing here is telling the story of the business. So right now, the only way I make any money, it's the only way that I've only ever made any money because everything I turn my hand to that isn't immigration, I've lost all my money and a lot of other people's money at the same time. Right. So um, if I can document what I'm doing and using the available resources that I've got and tell the story of the Hong Kong Visa Center, that will mean that we will make more money one way or the other. Um, because if you can get people's attention today, uh, that's the game, right? The only thing in the connection economy where we've got unlimited information, the only thing that's going to be valuable, valuable is people's attention. So ideas that spread win, knowing that the currency of attention means that you've got to put whatever you can out there to get people's attention. Naturally, I would put this stuff out. So does, d d does that mean that we will never make any money out of this? I don't know. We're just moving it organically. All I know is that I've now got the capability to tell the story and I want to tell it because uh, the title of this presentation, I mean, I just think that people are drinking the Kool-Aid and I don't think they really understand that what they're doing is just rubbish. You know, it just doesn't make any sense. So my question was, what should Coca-Cola do today? Well, I don't know, you see. I mean, the issue is, right, 
Coca-Cola's mission is to have Coca-Cola within reach. That's it, right? And if you think about what they've done, it's brilliant because you could quite reasonably say that Coca-Cola has their product on every single F&B menu or in venue anywhere in the world, right? You know, Coca-Cola is always within reach. I don't think you can take a content strategy and improve that, right? Whatever has worked, worked. You just just carry on doing it, but in a way that you know achieves those objectives using modern means of communication. I don't think you can, as we've seen, I don't think you can reinvent the world just because someone's got a really good idea that content is a new thing, right? And I said, hey, but that's you know, it's all bullshit. I think their challenge is whether you reach for the Pepsi, or you reach for the Coke. <laughs> Right? Because they're both, in most places you go, they're both available, you know, theoretically, unless, of course, one of them has strong arm, the other one out of a region. So but, none of, but, but I take that point completely. And, and so none of, not, none of the dynamics of how you consume Coca-Cola has changed between the industrial economy and the connection economy. The only dynamics that change is how you communicate that, right? right. And, you know, Coca-Cola capable of doing certainly capable of doing joined up thinking. I'm sure they've done joined up thinking. I suppose most of their joined up thinking is to ditch this, right? And say, well, okay, tactically, right? How do we achieve, you know, market share, maintain market share? I think that's just marketing, right? But now applied in the context of these different communication media. Yeah, it's just marketing through the web, essentially. Maybe they're solving a lot of different problems that people didn't know they had, you know? A sugar fix, for example. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I was watching a commercial. I saw a Coke commercial the other day, which I've seen several times. And, um, you know, they're not talking about the way that Coke tastes with the fact that it has lower calories than Pepsi, right? The whole message of the commercial is that the kid who's drinking the Coke gets the girl at the end of the commercial, right? So the problem that they're solving is actually the fact that they're targeting this market of young know, men who want to get a girl essentially mm -hmm. and the implied message is that if you're drinking coca-cola then you're going to get a girl right so that's the problem that they're solving and i think they can still tell that story through content marketing online but it's a lot difficult to connect what someone's going to search in google to coke right but what, do you mean by content marketing? what do you mean by content marketing well content marketing in the context of putting in more of information marketing, like what you're talking about online for your website, right? Providing the information necessary to your target audience. So the information in that case would be to, to move the social dynamics of the situation to avoid getting a girl. Is that what you're saying? Well, that's what the advertising is that they're doing. Right? So it's advertising, it's not? Yeah, I think so it's advertising. Right. right. Okay, well, I understand advertising, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think we're on the same page. I'm just saying yeah. that the problem is you can't connect a search on the web to the message that you're trying to do, right? Because your search on the web would be what? How do I get more girls? <laughs> <laughs> and Coca -Cola, you're not going to look at Coca-Cola no. to find that answer. No, right? no, true enough. So, so in that regard, it, it's clear that the platform is not Google, the, the platform is Facebook, right? right. No, what's very interesting is that Coca-Cola is going after the teenage audience. So their ideal customer is 12 to 18. And all of that target demographic consumes content on YouTube. So they're leveraging that platform by strategic collaborations with key influencers that are between that certain age, which have a lot of subscribers, let's say three, four, five million, and they create co-branded campaigns where the influencers themselves get to do what they enjoy and love, you know, happiness, all about that when it comes to Coke. And they shamelessly plug the product in there and they pretty much replicate what they do on TV online right now because when you have a FMSG product, it's all about the eyeballs. Yeah. So as many as you get, obviously, the better it is. Yeah, and it is a type of content marketing. Everything's under the content yeah. marketing umbrella, right? If you do product placement. Marketing. If you do product placement. So marketing. What is it? What's the key difference? Content marketing is something that you create yourself and you don't. No, content marketing you doesn't exist. We can't, we, you and I can't have the same <laughs> conversation because we have no definition for content marketing. Content marketing is marketing. Exactly, yeah. So it's just like in, it's somehow evolved because 
the way that the Digital Marketing Institute and Content Marketing Institute, all these platforms use content marketing is in terms of what you produce on the internet, your website. Well, these guys. Yeah. Well, no, these guys, it's, it's, it's the old adage, right? Those who can do, those who can't teach. So the Content Marketing Institute, who their entire proposition is to teach people about content marketing. So they're just propagating their own intellectual sort of know-how in this space, if you will, and telling everybody that this is what it's all about, this is a new big thing, and why it works, but actually doesn't work. That's not what I'm talking about. Great stuff. We're finished with the evening. Appreciate your attention. Thank you uh, for coming out, giving me the opportunity of an audience to uh, to shoot this stuff. Uh, I always tell uh, tell the guys if there's more than one person, it's an audience for me, uh, and it's not about those people who you know had other things to do tonight and couldn't show. It's about being able to sort of demonstrate some new thinking and uh, hopefully give you some uh, some ideas to go home with. So thanks very much. I'd rather chat.